Uh, who remembers this game? All right, so in Connect 4, you got to get four checkers in a row to win. Uh, does anybody have an idea of how many different possible combinations of all the checkers there are in the game? Anyone want to wager a guess? A lot. You got it right. It's a lot. Thousands. So it's, it's just short of four trillion different combinations. Now, for winning combinations, so like to get four in a row, they're just short of two trillion. Um, and I hope that's accurate. I looked that up on the internet, and I, if, if it's not accurate, then I'm being told really hard. By Google. So, yeah, it, it, the other thing about it that's interesting is that there is a way that you can win every time. So if you play first, you play in the middle, and at most it will take you 41 moves to win. All right, so why are we talking about Connect Four, and why am I telling you this? So... You know, when we, think of, when we think about defending our networks uh, from an adversary, it's a little bit like a game of Connect Four. And what I like, uh, how I like to compare penetration testing, so penetration testing, usually we're trying to make, you know, meet some objective, and it's very similar to we're trying to get the four checkers in a row so that we can get domain admin and own all the things, right? Um, but what about all these other combinations of things that are out there? How can we take those and, um, you know, enumerate all the different combination of factors that could lead to a compromise? <clears throat> so instead of asking this question that we do for pen testing, you know, how can an attacker do bad things to your system? That's, that's interesting. And that's where, I mean, look, I don't want to, you know, rag on pen testing. It's, it has its place, and I, I certainly uh, appreciate that. I, I come from a world where I, you know, I had a pen testing team that I was managing at Lockheed Martin. We had 25 people. We made a living doing this stuff. So, um, so I don't want to take too much away from it. But what if we could take it kind of to the next level and say, instead of just what, you know, bad things can the attacker do? What if we could say, you know, of all the ways that an attacker can do bad things, how can we observe, detect, and prevent? So think about that. Think about our the checkers in our Connect 4 game. Um, so with that, I want to set up our, the objectives I have for our, for our talk here. So one, uh, I want to introduce MITRE's attack framework. So to get through this, we're going to have to figure out how do we how do we enumerate some of these things that an attacker could do. So all of the checker combinations in the Connect 4 game. Two, um, I want to look at how we can break down that framework into some objective test cases. So something that gets out of the realm of things on spreadsheets and into the realm of, like, figuring out what kind of things we can do. And then also take all that and figure out how do we do, how do we take that, learn from it to do better defense. So that's what uh, the primary objectives are. Second objective would be to just use as many memes as possible to keep you guys awake. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, no meme yet, but we're getting there. Who knows what this is? Somebody say it. Kill chain. Cyber kill chain. All right, so probably no uh, surprise. I come from Lucky Martin, so we, we have to we have to pitch this. But this kind of starts a foundation, right? When you ask the question, how how do we understand the way that an attacker moves through an environment? Eh, it's kind of hard not to have that conversation about talking about some version of this, right? And is there anyone in the room who has not seen this before? It's it's okay. If you, I mean, if you haven't, it's okay. So. I'll give you the one minute version here. This describes you know, the steps that an attacker takes. And there's so many cool things that we can do with this from a defender perspective. One simple example, so from a security operations center, security analyst perspective, I want to look at this and understand like where did I detect this event happening and how far down into the kill chain did we go before we were able to detect it. And then once we do that, so let's say we caught an outbound C2 channel uh, because it was going to a DNS that we, that we know is bad. And we had applied that intelligence, we caught it, we blocked it, you know, and we, we saved the day, but what? Did we just stop there? No. We, we take that and figure out, you know, from like a root cause analysis perspective, how do we, how all this happened, you know, to the extent that we can. 
Uh, sometimes it's hard to get much past delivery, but usually delivery we can try to figure out, right? How did it get into our environment? Was it portable media? Uh, was it a uh, spear phishing email? What was it? That's what we call a late phase detection. But what if we had an early detection um, way up here in Deliver and our email security suite caught it, blocked it? Um, again, do we just stop there? I mean, depending on size of the shop you have and capabilities you have, maybe. But for some of the larger uh, shops, we don't stop there because we want to blow out you know, what would have happened if that campaign had been successful. So that's a cyber kill chain in, in a nutshell, one use case, a lot of other use cases for it. But one of the things that it, that it didn't do uh, when we started looking at creating some kind of uh, sort of threat emulation or really understanding at a tactic and technique level, it didn't, it didn't get it defined down to that level. So, you know, we look, looked around out there and said, there's got to be something else, right? There's got to be more beyond just describing it conceptually. And that's where we introduce uh, Miner's attack framework. So, who's heard of the attack framework prior to this? A few. So, we'll put it this way. More people have heard of the cyber kill chain than attack. So, I'm happy that I can share this with you here today because it's really cool. So, what is it? Um, so, I'm going to read the definition. Apologize for this, but attack for enterprise, and we'll learn what that distinction is here in a little bit, is a threat model and framework for describing the actions an adversary may take while operating within an enterprise network. Yeah, that's a little bit of a mouthful, but that sounds kind of like, you know, trying to understand all those different ways that we can win the Connect 4 game, right? Um, so they have these fr this framework, uh, they have it broken out for major operating systems. So they have a Windows version, uh, you know, OS X version, Linux version, which is really cool. And it focuses on, so this should look familiar. This is a slight adaptation of the cyber kill chain graphic that they use as a, as a reference. So the attack platform, the attack for enterprise platform focuses on kind of these last three steps. And there's good reason for that. These are the ones that technically um, are the easiest to get down and really understand granularly. We'll see in the future part of our discussion here how it's a little bit different than some of the early stages. So the attack framework focuses here, and then here are the kind of things that it breaks down. So out of you know, control, execute, and maintain, again, thinking about this as steps that an attacker takes, you see here on the list certain tactics that they might use. So we want to establish persistence, right? We want to escalate privileges. Um, so if, you know, if you're a pen tester, these sound like things that you would typically do in your pen test engagement, right? Uh, all the different things, lateral movement. These are all tactics that an attacker can use. And the attack framework kind of models this out for us. But I, put, I, should, I should have put the, uh, but wait, there's more <laughs> graphic here because it doesn't just stop there it goes down another level and says, you know, within that category of tactics, you know, really what are they doing, right? So, or what are the things that they're doing at a technique level? So I, I chose lateral movement, it's always a fun one. Um, and you can see the list here, and I'm gonna pick on a remote desktop protocol, and just to give you a, a feel for how this is broken out. So MITRE has a wiki where all of this is kind of linked in connected and you can just kind of click through. I've taken some you know, liberties to display it this way, but if you go to the MITRE site, ultimately you click on remote desktop protocol and you're going to get this page here that kind of says, what is remote desktop protocol? Why do we care about it from a lateral movement perspective? Um, and then beyond that, I don't, it's probably very hard to read in the back, I would guess, but down here you see examples of threat actors that have actually used it. So threat actors and campaigns that have used a remote desktop protocol as a lateral movement. Um, you also see some other sort of metadata that goes along with this in the framework. So this includes things like what operating systems you know, does it apply to, uh, what permissions are required, and what are log data sources where we can observe this activity. It becomes very important. Um, oh, I want to give one, one more example just to kind of round it out here. So if we go down to command and control, uh, you'll see 
this is abbreviated because there's a very long list, and I don't, I should have grabbed the exact number, I don't know uh, how many different techniques that they have enumerated, and it's continually changing, but it's a lot. Um, so we'll, we'll pick on this one, standard application layer protocol. So if I'm, uh, you know, late in that cyber kill chain, uh, my malware has done its thing, and now is making a call back out to, you know, my domain, uh, maybe I'm using a standard application layer protocol as a technique to accomplish that. Here's a description of how that works. Here are the threat actors that have used that. And as you can imagine, with C2 channels, there's all kinds of different C2 channels that, that you can get into that are uh, more or less obfuscated on the network. And you know, this is just for the purpose of example. So everyone kind of grasping how we're breaking this down um, into, you know, from the stage of the attack to the technique, or to, I'm sorry, to the tactic, to the technique level. Now by this point, I'm hoping that your wheels are spinning a little bit, you know, if you think about how I can use this as a defender. So this doesn't just, you know, speak to, you know, a pen tester or someone who wants to go design an attack as a defender. Hmm, I'm thinking about, you know, I mean, there might be some value that we can see here. All right, so I promised that we would talk about the early stage of the attacks, and this is something that Meyer likes to refer to as left of exploit. So the left of exploit things um, have the same kind of break, you know, breakdown and sort of uh, matrix of techniques, or tactics and techniques, and that they call it cleverly pre-attack, right? <laughs> so this is adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge for left of exploit. So if you start thinking about, okay, I could put these together, I can do different things with them. What you'll find, though, at the left of exploit, so for pre-attack, um, there are a lot more sort of policy-oriented things, uh, a little bit more strategic level than tactical level. Not in every case, but kind of generally speaking, um, that's true. And, you know, why is it? There's, there's a few reasons why that is. Um, one is... You know, it's hard, especially back in the recon and weaponized sort of stage of the attack, it's a little bit harder to get visibility to observe what's happening at that phase. Not impossible always, but um, certainly we know a lot more about how an adversary can operate in our network where we have the opportunity to observe that a lot more. All right, <laughs> let's, let's break it down, though. So we've talked about tactics and techniques, but... How, like, if I'm an attacker, how do I really get down to something, uh, or I'm a pen tester or someone who wants to use this as an offensive framework, how do I actually get down to a level where I can maybe make some objective test cases um, you know, based on the framework? Uh, and, and here's, and the, gosh, this is hard to read. But I wanted to show just a few examples of the things that we're looking at in terms of getting this broken down into... Uh, procedures, like a procedure level test case, right? Um, so create a new service named NTSSRB. Um, so some very sort of granular level things. And these are things that, you know, we, this is, you know, threat intelligence kind of things that we can um, put back into this framework. And we can turn those into test cases to see, do we have, um, you know, are we doing something about this if it's in the environment? Uh, and it really enables us to ask three questions, all right? Uh, hopefully, people will like that. So, three questions. The, the memes get heavier as we go. <laughs> uh, question one, did we observe it? Um, so, if you think about this, if, if this is your own network and you're taking some test cases out of here, you know, um, and, and you, you execute those, you can ask yourself the first question, did we observe it, okay? And that's worth recording in itself. It's a measure of visibility, right? If, if, if it's something on the endpoint, if there's privilege escalation that happens on the endpoint, uh, do you have an endpoint security tool that can see that, or is it just going to be completely lost in your environment? So that's the first important question. Second uh, important question is, did we detect it? So one is more about a capability to even see it. 
Uh, the second one is, did we have something automated in place that was able to detect that activity? So whether it was network-based intrusion detection, host-based intrusion detection, or some other security control that we had, um, were we able to detect it? The third question is, did we prevent it? So, you know, are we able, actually able to execute the test case successfully? Were we able to escalate privileges? Uh, were we able to create that service? Um, or was it blocked? And, you know, so those are, these are three, the question's three, right? From that, we can start populating this sort of heat map view, if you will, of, um, of what capabilities we have specific to an adversary technique. And the reason why I love this is because this is, you know, this gives you a really objective view. Uh, now, for those of you in the front row who can see this well. Two places you better change something. Yeah. But don't overanalyze this too much because I made this random data. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, and I actually looked at it and I was like, uh, really are we, where was it? There was something. Are we really going to be able to observe, detect, detect and block That's overriding cool. firmware with custom malicious? Maybe. I mean, I, if you're that... Yeah, yeah. If you're, um, if you can, that's fantastic. Especially in the world that I come from, um, I think I mentioned I spent a lot of time in the industrial control system side of things. So visibility there is really tough sometimes. So, but you know, you start seeing how this could come together uh, in a test and really understand at a, at a pretty granular level what is you know, what is possible in your network. Um, now, I was talking to someone a little bit earlier about this and like the number of, you know, the number of test cases that are possible here is huge. So you gotta prioritize, right? So we're not gonna test every single possible one of the four trillion or two trillion uh, connect four possibilities, but we can, you know, prioritize those based on what we know to be active um, or if there are some things that we know we need to highlight in our environment, like you know, maybe we know that, you know, we're just not detecting or watching anything, uh, our security operations center just does not know what they're doing, and you know, and we want to we want to kind of find out, you know, where do they not have visibility? Um, so there are some like specific things that you can do and ways to use this to help bring some of those issues to light. And um, I'm gonna I'm blowing through this really quickly. So, um, so in terms of benefit, you know, we've we've seen. Some of the examples, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of, of using this in purple teaming, right? So we're used to traditional, you know, red team attacker, blue team defender. You hear a lot now about purple teaming. Using this uh, framework and this concept in a purple team engagement is really kind of perfect, right? Because you have the ability um, to, to see, you know, if you're working in conjunction with your defenders, you can run a test case and then really be able to go back and populate this based on what they were able to see, detect. And it, it takes, you know, while it's adversarial in the sense that we're modeling adversarial techniques, it takes some of the adversarial uh, feel away from it. And it's like, hey, we're all trying to get better here together, right? Um, and so we're going to run this, and then we're going to check all of our instrumentation and see, do we even have the ability to observe it? Um, and then if so, was there automated detection? You know, question three. So that's, that's one aspect of this. Um, the next, next aspect of it is really a, a capabilities baseline. So once you have developed that prioritized um, you know, list or you know, of the test cases, we can come in and say, okay, here's where we're at today. We can run those again six months from now and see how our capabilities have advanced. And you know, at that point, maybe you, know, maybe you picked 100 test cases to begin with you know, the most common things that you wanted to be able to observe, detect, and prevent. And maybe you dive a little bit deeper. Um, and then you think about some of the metrics that you could pull back out of this, right? Um, because you could then go bring it back up to the sort of top level cyber field chain and say, we're really good at um, detecting C2, for example but maybe we just have a complete lack of visibility on our email system and our delivery, our ability to detect something back at the delivery stage is really poor. Uh, and so we can, we can use that then to start thinking about how do we prioritize 
our cybersecurity investments so that we are not just following whatever the latest you know, marketing material says, but we're tailoring something and building a custom set of capabilities in our environment to meet the needs you know, that we have uh, or the gaps that we have based on real objective input. Um, and I think that's really where this offers value. And again, back to the comparison on pen testing, I've been, you know, a lot of times in the, we've been briefing a pen test to a group of executives uh, or even the board sometimes, and we tell the story of, you know, uh, at, at the right level, you know, based on Ben's guidance, right? We're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to, you know, get too deep. But basically tell them, you know, how we were able to compromise their domain, what that means in terms of business impact to them, um, but it's it's typically, you know, we were given an objective and we demonstrated that we could meet that objective. Uh, that's not to say that if you close the gaps that you had that allowed us to get, you know, to meet that objective, that everything is fixed because it's not. Um, and our, our thinking and my thinking on this kind of objective testing is that we're taking a step toward, a, you know, a more comprehensive approach and, um, and you know again it's it's not a fit probably for every enterprise for every organization um, but for many organizations I think this kind of thing as a concept will really help you in that purple teaming style engagement improve uh, capability of your defense and, and ultimately make your networks uh, and systems more defendable and that's it so I, I that blew through that really, really quickly. So uh, I have I have time for questions, I think, and I'd be happy to entertain some. Ben, where can I get the attack framework? Is that something I can play with personally, or do you need to hire somebody to run it? Um, yeah, you can you can get that. Great question. I know you have the answer to this already, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, if you go to attack.miter.org. There you'll see the, the wiki page that I kind of highlighted before that will allow you to do all the deep dive into it. Also, if you are used to, or have, let me just ask, I'll always ask the question, who has the capability to do something with sticks? The sticks protocol. Okay, a couple hands. So there is a sticks representation of uh, the entire, uh, at least on the enterprise framework side of it. Um, you may know, do you know if there's a sticks Okay, uh, there may be for for the pre-attack as well. I know Attack for Enterprise has a sticks uh, representation. Um, also, a, another part of Attack that I didn't mention is they they have it's a little bit newer, but they also have a mobile um, application framework as well, uh, or mobile attack framework that I think is also really promising and interesting. I think it still needs some more industry participation uh, to expand out the the matrix of techniques and tactics, but um, who else has a question? Yes, sir. You can classify your data to help you in the attack determine what type of data is more vulnerable and has a higher scale that you can um, Let me just make sure I heard you. You're talking about classifying data to make... EPI is something. Uh-huh, okay. okay. So when you have your data, you can look at the whole company, there's a real estate all the data, and you only have limited resources. Is there anything that you would recommend to help for prioritizing buyers? Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the question is, can you know, is there anything that I would recommend for doing prioritization based on classification of the data? And the answer is yes. And I'll, I'll tell you where, like at a very tactical level, where this has come into play when we've done similar um, things to this in the past. Uh, one of our test cases has been to exfiltrate some data. Um, and we'll exfiltrate in, you know, 15, 20, 50 different ways, right, in terms of size, um, type of data. You know, so we'll mock up PPI, mock up credit card number, social security information, um, zip it up and exfil it out of your network and see if you notice. Um, and it's amazing <laughs> how... <laughs> That gets lost in the noise, but um, I'm not answering your question quite yet, but I'm just using that as an example that 
So we, we do take kind of a data-centric approach, especially when we're looking at organizations that, that have PPI or have some high-value intellectual property that they're trying to protect. Um, we will mock up test case scenarios that, um, that go right at the heart of what is important to their business. Um, so it comes into play from that perspective. I think the other place, just in terms of, you know, you've got this you know, ocean of test, potential test cases out here. I think the, where it would come into play in terms of prioritization for that could be the systems that, you know, if you've done data classification, you know where the highest classification level of data exists in your environment. Uh, you might do some targeting of those environments uh, with specific test cases to see. Does that answer your question? So, yeah. yeah. But the most, I mean, the most fun example of the data classification stuff is doing exfiltration. So, I didn't mention this and we didn't see an example, but if I go back to, um, this version of the kill chain, this act on objectives right here is where we find things like uh, data exfiltration. If that's the intent of the attack is, is to ultimately steal data from your organization, um, you know, we'll see that here. And again, really fun test cases to be made with mocking up that data or if you have permission. Um, well, let me just preface all of this, of course, instead of permission. <laughs> But if you, if you have permission to do so and you have some of the real data, sometimes what we'll do is, is look for, you know, if an organization has a good data classification program, you usually have a document marking that goes with that. So that's the other thing we'll do is exfil documents that have their markings on them and determine their capability to do that. Yes, sir? You use expanded kill chains to go down into different things. And I've seen other, read other presentations on it. Do you have any good resources for early, like level three and four uh, expanded kill chain resources? Um, three and four, like you mean, like getting back to kind of left of exploit capabilities right. and um, really expanded that and breaking it down into pieces to, to look at. Do you know any good well, I resources? Well, I mean, the attack framework itself, you know, does that with pre attack. And I didn't show you all of the examples here. But like in terms of additional resources to really figure out how do we get better at detecting at that level, I don't have anything off the top of my head. But I mean, we're at VSets. Anyone else have any anything at these early stages that they've seen that might um, help answer the question? Remind me later. I'll tell you once. But I can't. Put, I, I can't put it out every week. <laughs> that, that tactics one. That is that a weird story. Put up that there was a lot of good stuff that I'm going to go. I, Picture, I'll go back through it. Yeah. Some of it was one and two, which you really can't do too much. Yeah, yeah. so you mean um, uh, the pre attack was. Yeah, that's here. Right. Yeah. yeah. There was some nice things in that. I, yes. Uh, yeah, I, but I would highly encourage you to, to go dig into So each one of these just. I didn't show it I here. Got it, I will. Yeah, but each one of these, just like, um, just like we saw here, each one of these tactics gets broken out into techniques. And so you have that here too, and that may answer a bunch of your question when you start when you see like the breakout of you know, priority definition plan and then build capabilities. You know, for example, great questions. Any other questions? Yeah. Not necessarily a minor general, but you said that you led um, the testing team at Lockheed. I did, yeah. So, having been in the industry for a while, do you see any common faults with most um, testing consultants and what you see as solutions to those, or are, are a lot of the common issues with them kind of self created due to you know, sales, essentially? Uh, what, what's your take on the Industry yeah, so I think the question, and correct me if I'm not getting it right, but I think the question is, um, in terms of the way that this is done by other organizations in industry, um, what are the common, you know, faults, or how are they not getting it right, kind of, is that what you were going? Do yeah, how, how do we do things better? Um, I, I think, 
So, so yes, I see a lot of things not done well, and I, but I, on the flip side of that, I see a lot of firms that are advancing their capabilities and doing things well. Um, that's a really generic answer, but I'll, I'll try to make it a little more real. I think a lot of the things that Ben hit on in his presentation are challenges uh, that our industry has, especially consulting firms, right? Um, just put it, say this, it's, it's not that special to go into an environment and get domain ed. It's, you know, and you, you can, it, it's made its impact, and if you can find a good way to explain it uh, to the business, again, to Ben's point, um, to, to cause them to take action to do something to, to fix the challenges that are there, then you've won. Um, but if you, if, if you just want to go in and celebrate and be like, you know, hey, I got, <laughs> I got domain admin, and we're, you know, we own your, we own your environment, and uh, you blue team guys don't know what the heck you're doing, and um, you know, that's not what, from, uh, from my perspective, and, and you know, I don't want to you know, castigate out the whole industry. There, there are certainly firms that, that do that, but there are, I would say, increasingly, um, people who understand the context that we're operating in here. It's not, it's not just. I'm just really going to point back to Ben's presentation. <laughs> Great question, though. Jason, I, think, I just might add, I think your whole notion of purple teaming is it's on that point, because I've seen other presentations where and, uh, if you go to Iron Peak and, and do a search for any con, there's a great presentation of Paul there, a pen tester who's saying he's, yeah, red team is going to be out of business pretty soon. This notion of the true red team is going to be a purple team. Yeah, I think I think the days of you know we're going to drop in, you know, show you how awesome we are. We're the hack source, and see you later. I, I, no one's getting value out of that. That's you know I think that's why the purple teaming concept is becoming so big, and not just for external consultants, for large organizations that have internal works that do this. Right, it's the same kind of thing. Um, there are some you know big companies that have internal red and blue organizations that historically, I mean, it's, I mean, the animosity and the, the, you know, the, the headbutting between these groups, it's like, guys, we're all here to, to do, we have the same mission. We, um, so, you know, I think that, that as well as really being able to put, to take these technical concepts and put them in language that the business can understand and make decisions about. I'll, if I had to, like, boil down everything, I mean, I, I've been doing Cybersecurity consulting in one way or another for uh, a long time. Uh, I, I guess, like in a full term, full time consultant role over ten years now. Um, almost everyone, the question that that organizations want to answer is, how do I evaluate and prioritize my cybersecurity investments? I know, you know, I I, I think there's a level of awareness now that it's that's part of the cost of doing business, mm -hmm. but how do I take that? And understand really where to spend my money because I mean, who's seen all of the vendors that are out there? I mean, there are <laughs> countless vendors. Even in just just in my world, I spend a lot of time. I mentioned focused on ICS. In, in ICS, there's this you know the hotness is uh, this network anomaly detection, right? It's it's a big deal. There are like twenty some companies out there doing it, and it's great. I mean, it's it's great that we have the focus there. Not all twenty of those companies are going to make it. Um, but they, organizations have all these messages coming in from those 20 companies and, you know, thousands of others that buy our stuff and we will help you be more secure. And without really something objective to hold that up against and a, a, a really effective way to prioritize that, um, you will likely be disappointed with the results that you get. Any other questions? Very good. I appreciate the, uh, the interaction. Uh, thank you guys for having me here, and thank you, Beth, for you know, setting up this event. Um, really excited. Uh, thank him for breakfast. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> You're welcome.